How the Leopard Got His Spots by Rudyard Kipling. In the days when everybody started fair, best beloved, the leopard lived in a place called the High Veldt. Remember, it wasn't the Low Veldt or the Bush Veldt or the Sour Veldt, but the exclusively bare, hot, shiny High Veldt where there was sand and sandy coloured rock and exclusively tufts of sandy yellowish grass. Giraffe and the zebra and the eland and the kudu and the hearty beast lived there and they were exclusively sandy yellow brownish all over. But the leopard, he was the exclusivest, sandiest, yellowish, brownish of them all. A grey ish yellowish catty shape kind of beast and he matched the exclusively yellow ish grey ish brown ish colour of the high veld to one hair. Hmm. This was very bad for the giraffe and the zebra and the rest of them for he would lie down by a exclusively yellowish, greyish, brownish stone or clump of grass. And when giraffe or the zebra or the eland or the kudu or the bushbuck or the bonchibuck came by, he would surprise them out of their jumpsome lives. He would indeed. Hmm. And also there was an Ethiopian with bows and arrows, exclusively greyish, brownish, yellowish man he was then, um, who lived on the high veld with the leopard, and the two of them used to hunt together, the Ethiopian with his bows and arrows, and the leopard, exclusively with his teeth and claws till the giraffe and the eland and the kudu and the quagga and all the rest of them didn't know which way to jump. Best beloved, they didn't know indeed. After a long time, things lived ever so long in those days, they learned to avoid anything that looked like a leopard or an Ethiopian. And bit by bit, the giraffe began it because his legs were the longest. They went away from the high veld. They scuttled for days and days and days till they came to a great forest, exclusively full of trees and bushes and stripy, speckly, patchy, blatchy shadows. And there they hid. And after a long time, uh, what with standing half in the shade and half out of it, and what with the slippery, slidey shadows of the trees falling on them, the giraffe grew blotchy, and the zebra grew stripy, and the eland and the kudu grew darker, uh, with little grey wavy lines on their backs, like bark on a tree. Mm. And so, although you could hear them and smell them, you could very rarely see them. Hmm. Except when you knew exactly where to look. Hmm. They had a beautiful time in the exclusively speckly, spickly shadows of the forest while the leopard and the Ethiopian ran about over the exclusively greyish, yellowish, reddish high veld outside, wondering where all their breakfasts and their dinners and their teas had gone. At last, they were so hungry that they ate rats and beetles and rock rabbits, the leopard and the Ethiopian. And then they had the big tummy ache both together. And then, 
they met Barvian, the dog-headed barking baboon, who is quite the wisest animal in all South Africa. Mm. Said leopard to Barvian, and it was a very hot day, where has all the game gone? And Barvian winked. He knew. Said the Ethiopian to Barvian, Can you tell me the present habitat of the Aboriginal fauna? That meant just the same thing, but the Ethiopian always used long words. He was a grown-up. And Barvian winked. He knew. Then said Barvian, the game has all gone to other spots, and my advice to you, Leopard, is to go into other spots as soon as you can. And the Ethiopian said, that's all very fine, but I wish to know whither the Aboriginal fauna has migrated. Then said Barvian, the Aboriginal fauna has joined the Aboriginal flora because it was high time for a change. And my advice to you, Ethiopian, is to change as soon as you can. Now, that puzzled the leopard and the Ethiopian, but they set off to look for the Aboriginal flora. And presently, after ever so many days, they saw a great, high, tall forest full of tree trunks, all exclusively packed, speckled and spotted, and spotted and dotted, and splashed and slashed, and hatched and cross-hatched with shadow. Say that quickly aloud and you'll see how very shadowy the forest must have been. What is this, said the leopard, that is so exclusively dark and yet so full of little pieces of light? I don't know, said the Ethiopian, but it ought to be Aboriginal flora. I can smell giraffe and I can hear giraffe but I can't see giraffe hmm that's curious said the leopard I suppose it's because we've just come in out of the sunshine because I can smell the zebra and I can hear zebra but I can't see Zebra. Wait a bit, said the Ethiopian. It's a long time since we've hunted them. Perhaps we've forgotten what they were like. Fiddle, said the leopard. I remember them perfectly on the high veld, especially their marrow bones. Giraffe is about 17 feet high, uh, of exclusively full of us, Golden yellow from head to heel, and zebra is about four and a half feet high, of exclusively grey fawn colour from head to heel. Hmm, said the Ethiopian, looking into the speckly, speckly shadows of the Aboriginal flora forest. Then they ought to show up in this dark place like ripe bananas in a smokehouse. But they didn't. The leopard and the Ethiopian hunted all day. And though they could smell them, and though they could hear them, they never saw one of them. Hmm. For goodness sake, said the leopard at tea time. Let's wait until it gets dark. This daylight hunting is a perfect scandal. So... They waited till dark, and then the leopard heard something 
breathing sniffily in the starlight that fell stripy all through the branches. And he jumped at the noise and it smelt like the zebra. <clears throat> and it felt like the zebra and when he knocked it down, bang, boom, it kicked like the zebra. Hmm. But he couldn't see it. So he said, be quiet, oh you person without any form. I am going to sit on your head till morning because there's something about you that I don't understand. Hmm. Presently, he heard a grunt and a crash and a scramble and the Ethiopian called out, I've caught a thing that I can't see. It smells like giraffe. It kicks like giraffe, but it hasn't any form. Don't you trust it, said the leopard. Sit on its head until the morning. Same as me. They haven't any form, any of them. So, they sat down on them hard until bright morning time. And then leopard said, what have you got at your end of the table, brother? The Ethiopian <sighs> scratched his head and said, It ought to be exclusively a rich, fulvous orange tawny from head to heel. And it ought to be a uh, giraffe, but it's all covered over with chestnut blotches. What have you got at your end of the table, brother? And the leopard... He scratched his head and said, It ought to be exclusively a delicate greyish fawn, and it ought to be zebra, but it's covered all over with black and purple stripes. What in the world have you been doing to yourself, zebra? Don't you know that if you were on the high veld, I could see you ten miles off? You haven't any fawn. Yes, said the zebra, but this isn't the high veld. Can't you see? Oh, I, I, I can now, said the zebra, said the leopard, but I couldn't all yesterday. How was it done? Let us up, said the zebra, and we'll show you. So they let the zebra and the giraffe get up. And the zebra moved away to some little thorn bushes where the sunlight felt all stripy and the giraffe moved off to some tallest trees where the shadows fell all blotchy. Now, watch, said the zebra and the giraffe. This is the way it's done. One, two, three, and where's your breakfast? Leopard stared, and Ethiopian stared, but all they could see was stripy, stripy, stripy shadows and blotchy, blotchy shadows in the forest, but never a sign of zebra or giraffe. They just walked off and hidden themselves in the shadowy forest. Hi, hi, said the Ethiopian, that's a trick worth learning. Take a lesson by it, leopard. You show up in this dark place like a bar of soap in a coal scuttle. Ho, ho, said the leopard. Would it surprise you very much to know that you show up in this dark place like a mustard plaster on a sack of coal? Oh, huh. well, calling names won't catch dinner, said the Ethiopian. The long and the little of it is that we don't match our backgrounds. I'm going to take Bavian's advice. He told me I ought to change. And as I've got nothing except my skin, I'm going to change that. What to? asked the leopard, tremendously excited. To a nice working blackish brownish colour with a little purple in it and touches of slaty blue 
It'll be the very thing for hiding in hollows and behind trees. So he changed his skin. There and then. And the leopard was more excited than ever. He'd never seen a man change his skin before. Huh. But what about me, he said, when the Ethiopian had worked his last little finger into his fine new black skin. You take Barvian's advice too. He told you to go into spots. Hmm. So I did, said the leopard. I went into other spots as fast as I could. I went into this spot with you. And a lot of good it's done me. Oh, said the Ethiopian. Barvian didn't mean spots in South Africa. He meant spots on your skin. What's the use of that, said the leopard. Think of giraffe, said the Ethiopian. Or, if you prefer stripes, think of zebra. They find their spots and stripes give them perfect satisfaction. Hmm, said the leopard. I wouldn't look like zebra. Not forever so. Well, make up your mind, said the Ethiopian. Because I'd hate to go hunting without you. But I must, if you insist on looking like a sunflower against the tanned fence. <coughs> I'll take spots then, said the leopard. But don't make them too vulgar big. I wouldn't look like a giraffe, not forever so. I'll make them with the tips of my fingers, said the Ethiopian. There's plenty of black left on my skin still. Stand over. Then the Ethiopian put his five fingers close together. Just like that. There were plenty of black left on his new skin and pressed them all over the leopard. And wherever the five fingers touched, they left five little black marks. All close together. You can see them on any leopard skin you like, best beloved. Sometimes the fingers slipped and the marks got a little blurred. But if you look closely at any leopard, you will see there are always five spots of five black fingertips. Hmm. Now you are a beauty, said the Ethiopian. You can lie out on the bare ground and look like a heap of pebbles. You can lie out on the naked rocks and look like a piece of pudding stone. You can lie out on a leafy branch and look like sunlight sifting through the leaves. And you can look and lie right across the centre of a path and look like Nothing in particular. Think of that and purr. <laughs> but if I'm in all this, said the leopard, why didn't you go spotty too? Oh, plain black's the best for an Ethiopian. Now, come along and we'll see if we can't get even with Mr. One, two, three, where's your breakfast? <laughs> so they went away and they lived Happily ever afterwards, best beloved, that is all. Oh, now and then you will hear grown-ups say, Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or can the leopard change his spots? I don't think even grown-ups would keep on saying such a silly thing if the leopard and the Ethiopian hadn't done so once before. You... Mm. But they'll never do it again. They're quite contented as they are.